Uh, excellent. I'd like to introduce the panel that we have today. Uh, Dr. Helen Ganil is Director of Higher Education Integrity Unit at TEXA. And Dr. Grant Clinkham at the end is CEO of the New Zealand Qualifications Authority. Professor Jeannie Patterson, co-director of Centre for Artificial Intelligence and Digital Ethics at the University of Melbourne. And finally, uh, Mairead Bolan, Senior Manager, Academic Integrity, Regulation and Strategic Partnerships, Quality and Qualifications Island. So super international panel to discuss this topic. And I'm going to ask each of the panellists to reflect on the topic of the panel to start. Uh, academic integrity in the world of social media, free kick or free reign. What are the emerging trends regarding the impact of social media on academic integrity, positive or negative? I might go to Helen first. Thanks, Claire. Uh, great to be here. Hi, everybody. Look, we know from what students tell us um, and also from what my team does in terms of monitoring social media that there are a, a huge volume of ads for cheating services on social media uh, and that students are bombarded on their, on their personal accounts all the time. So we know it's an issue. It's one of the reasons that um, our integrity unit has a social media strategy and we're trying to work with those companies to understand the best way to get that content removed from their platforms. Excellent, thank you. I might go down the end. Grant, what's your reflections on the topic? Um, look, I think it's tempting to argue that social media is just another of many channels um, to be aware of and to manage. But actually that position would underestimate the truly pernicious and ubiquitous nature of um, cheating services available through social media. and. I'm sure many of you are aware that when you dive into the detail of these sites, the goal of repurposing words like quality and integrity and plagiarism free work and um, repurposing those words for nefarious ends is quite a surreal experience. And it's clear that through social media there is an increasingly discipline specific personalised and manipulative approach to engaging with learners with lots of reassurance cues that are designed to normalise um, access to um, th those services. Are there social media sites that are um, able to be accessed by students for much more positive academically reinforcing purposes? Um, absolutely there are but also bad actors use those same sites to make um, approaches. So ultimately governments, regulators and institutions are pretty hamstrung and it really requires support for students to make good judgments about what um, spaces are safe and valued, which spaces are grey and might lead to poor choices and which spaces online are just downright dangerous. Mm. Thank you. Jeannie, am I going to you? Um, well, I'd have to say um, I entirely agree entirely with Grant, but um, my background is actually as a consumer protection lawyer and I spend a lot of time looking at social media marketing strategies. And what we know is that um, social media markets alcohol to children it markets, it markets unrealistic Im body images to young people and it markets cheating services to students and if students are bombarded enough with ads about how to do academia through contract cheating services, and that's not the word that's used, the words that are used are things like assistance, help, quality, not plagiarism, then we can understand that this is a problem that maybe is not new, but has taken a new form. It's amplified. And my suggestion would be that we also need to look closely at the social media companies themselves and how they're regulated and the transparency around the micro-targeting that occurs through social media. Mm. Thank you. Am I right? Thanks, Claire. Um, well, I suppose I'll echo what we're hearing from Helen, from Grant, from Jeannie. Um, in Ireland, um, it's very similar. We're hearing from students that they are being targeted on social media and that's right across the breadth of platforms. So. Um, 
Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Um, and I suppose, as Jeannie has said, and as Grant said, some of that um, targeted messaging is really, really pernicious. Um, and contract cheating companies are very clever about, you know, um, trying to, to um, I suppose, target perceived weaknesses of learners. So you're an international learner, it must be very difficult for you, we can, we can help you with that, or you are neurodivergent, we can help you with that. We're hearing that from students in Ireland. Um, so I suppose, absolutely, it is really, really important that we look to social um, media platforms um, and that we ask them to, to work with us so that when we identify this kind of really pernicious and dangerous messaging, that they work with us to remove it. So equally, as, as, in, as TEXA is doing, we in Ireland are working with a number of social media platforms to put reporting processes in place, or indeed we have reporting processes in place, and, and remove ads. Um, but I do think that, that students, um, you know, awareness raising in education is really important, so that students are aware of the dangers of engaging with these, um, with these bad actors. Um, through social media as, as harmless as it may seem. And also, I think one of the other things we're seeing is, you know, students use this to communicate. So yeah. they'll set up a group for their course yeah. where they're all chatting and the contract cheating companies will manage to get into that group. They will infiltrate that group yep. and then be acting like another student. I'm here to help and I figured this out and offering their services. So it's not just the advertising and it's not just the influencers, which is another whole thing on platforms like TikTok. They're not actually employed by the company. They're just spruiking it. Yep. They might be getting payments or micropayments in the background, but sometimes they're just saying, you know, oh, did you know you can actually pay <laughs> someone to do that? So there's lots of different elements to it rather yep. than just the advertising. Yeah, I think that's right. Though I'd have to say I think influencer advertising is the most insidious form of advertising. Especially and if for you that do a marketing degree, yeah. you will find that guerrilla <laughs> marketing, which is what that's called, yeah. is in fact the most effective marketing strategy because essentially what companies are doing is getting the consumer to do the marketing for them yeah. and yet they're at ha arm's length. So I agree with you. I think that that's precisely the you know the the, ins the difficulty in this field. Mm. Mm -hmm. What do you, so, my question to the regulators, we've got three countries represented here today. What are you actually doing about contract cheating on the social media platforms? What's your actual practical uh, actions? And I might go to Grant you first in New Zealand. Um, maybe just a quick description of our legislative context because it's perhaps an interesting um, case study. So in 2011, we um, made a criminal offence the um, advertising of contract um, cheating services or the provision of those services. Um, now, quite a lot of academic commentary around the New Zealand legislation suggests that having to prove intent in the minds of the provider um, of the service is too high a legal threshold and that a strict liability approach to such legislation whether it's covering a traditional website or a social media site, um, would be better. Now, in the last 11 years, there hasn't been a single case of using the legislation for prosecution, although in 2013-14, there was a very big case of assignment for you, which ultimately resulted in the forfeiture of significant amounts of property off the back of um, the proceeds of crime and the police chose a different legislative um, instrument to, um, to gain progress. But um, on the one hand, the, f the legislative form looks inadequate, but actually it has proved to be effective in removing, for a decade, New Zealand-based companies that are offering such services. On the other hand, of course, students are easily able to access um, offshore companies, and um, it would require further legislative interventions to get ISP providers by law to have to remove such sites. We are in the process of working with the Ministry of Education and with Universities New Zealand to consider policy options um, in that area. Wow, so uh, Mairead, surely uh, nothing's happening in Ireland in this space? There's plenty happening in, in Ireland, <laughs> yeah. Um, so. I suppose our, our legislation is, is similar to the New Zealand legislation. It also criminalises the advertisement of, um, of, of academic cheating and the publication of such advertising. 
Um, and what we've been doing um, is we've been trying to work proactively and collaboratively with social media platforms um, so that we report instances, we, we monitor the, their sites, we report instances of misuse of their sites, so of, of advertising by contract cheating companies, and they remove um, th those ads. But I suppose it's just, um, it is a massive, massive workload involved in doing that. It's huge. We're a very small team, and it's really difficult to keep on top of it. Um, so I suppose we do encourage our, our, um, our higher education institutions to also conduct that kind of monitoring work and, and encourage learners when they come across this kind of, these ads, to report them to us um, so that we can, it, it just makes our, our job a little bit easier. Um, we had talked, we'd, we'd broached the, the um, issue of potentially filters on some of the social media sites that would, um, you know, uh, I suppose scan for particular terms or particular combinations of terms. Um, that has to date not been something that social media platforms are willing to entertain. Um, but I suppose other ways that we're considering um, working with, with platforms and drawing attention to this issue is looking at um, targeted advertising through social media um, and working with some of our um, some of our SU or student unions, for example, um, to to push out that advertising. So, so that's something that's in the works at the moment. Mm, great, uh, Helen. What's happening in Australia? Um, so, look, we've probably of the three agencies, our legislation is probably slightly more workable and we've probably had the most success in leveraging it. So we had our first test case go through the federal court in September last year where we were successful in getting the um, court to direct the internet service providers to block access to a cheating website. And we really used that to drive forward the conversation with the social media companies to say to them, look, you, we, we can tell you that we know how to use our legislation, we understand what will satisfy the court, so where we've gone through that internal process, we want you to um, remove those sites. Uh, we've then uh, signed protocols with the internet service providers to not have to go through the federal court for them to trust our process. So we've now blocked over 150 websites. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we've had their social media ac accounts deleted from, especially from Meta and Gumtree. Um, those are the companies that, that to date we've had uh, a lot of success in working with. Um, Meta's given us a, a government reporting channel, a dedicated channel, and they're removing stuff within, I think, hours of us reporting it to them. So that's been really effective. But the platforms are all slightly different. So, you know, the way, the way it works with that company is not necessarily what will work with, um, uh, who we, what's the, TikTok. That's the one we met with most recently. So, so it's really trying to understand how we can work with them, not just saying you have to take it down because we said so, but understanding what's an effective way for us to give them the information so that we can get to that, that system where they trust our process and they're really responsive to us. Um, and then the other thing we've tried to do is um, the team, but especially uh, Camilla in my team, has set up a lot of analytics so that we're working with the platforms that are referring the most traffic, because it's huge. You have to start somewhere. And being able to um, monitor which are the websites that are the biggest players, let's block them first, which are the social media platforms that are referring the most traffic to those websites, let's go and talk to them first. So trying to have it re be really data-led. That's amazing. So as a mother of three children who are all uh, teenagers, how do you keep up with the platforms? I mean, it's like you turn around, there's a new social media platform you've never heard about. Um, how can you keep one step ahead? It might go to you first, Jeannie. For me? Oh, yeah. great. Small question there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the first thing I'd say is there's no one answer to responding to the problem of social media and contract cheating because we've just heard very effective mechanisms for shutting down websites and responding to, to predatory advertising online about these, um, these services. But it's an endless game. It's kind of a whack-a-mole game. And if we look what's happening in other forms of um, social of marketing or digital marketing, um, people like sorry, alcohol advertisers know they're not allowed to advertise to children and they're not allowed to advertise in certain forums. So making use of different types of advertising, which is influencer advertising and user-generated advertising. And I'm, I suspect 
that that's the same pattern that we'll see increasingly with contract cheating advertising because the quicker the websites are shut down, the more effective it is to pay people to pretend to be students and talk about it. Um, so we should of course do all the measures that I've talked about but need to be aware that social media being social media, there's always going to be a new way of doing things, a new form of pushing this advertising. And I was really interested in what Grant and Claire said, I think all of you said, about also using the same strategies to talk to students. Um, because at the end of the day, this is a bad, this is a bad product for students. Um, it may be bad in the long term, it may be bad in the short term, but if students are, are cognitive or understand the immediate risks of engaging with these platforms, that's important too. Yeah, we've actually just paid for some boosted, um, so Texa created four short videos to, aimed at students to help them understand the very real risks of engaging with these services, such as blackmail. Um, and we've just promoted those on social media. So we, we release them into the wild. Surprisingly, not that many students subscribe to Texa. Uh, so, th <laughs> so, so then we paid for boosted advertising. And I think in the first six hours, we got as many clicks as we'd had, you know, when we just had them on our channel. So yeah, absolutely using that to get to students is really important. You should do a TikTok video. My son would hate me if I did that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think student-staff partnership is really important in this work and we need to be listening to what students are telling us, you know, that they're seeing, um, what's, what's motivating them. I've actually seen some really effective use of social media and of, of TikTok, in fact, by student union representatives um, highlighting the importance of, of behaving with integrity and learning with integrity. Um, there's a really brilliant um, uh, student union representative in the University of Central Lancashire in the UK called Steph Lomas, who has set up a TikTok channel and is, is, is producing those videos. So that kind of thing is, is really useful and effective, I think. Did you want to add something, Grant? Um, just the obvious comment that um, the answer to your question about how you keep ahead is that um, you never do adequately. And so the question is how to frame this challenge. Is it one um, principally about managing the criminality of the providers, or it is, is it fundamentally a teaching, learning, assessment and student wellbeing mm. issue with regulators um, in the background um, assiduously sending symbolic messages about the unacceptability of it through various you know, legislative um, and statutory interventions. But I think one of the issues that we all need to, um, to think about is the extent to which the massification, the commodification of tertiary education in some ways might not be leading us down the path of making um, uh, you know, good inroads to the cheating problem more difficult. So Professor Davis this morning talked about this strength and the weaknesses of scale. So we know for sure from the literature that there are certain practices such as how, assessment, um, how assessments are structured, um, what type of relationships with students exist that can be key not to removing but to reducing instances of cheating. And yet there is something about the massification of education that militates against redesigning assessments in a manner that can truly help or building more uh, closer relationships with students in a way that really helps academic staff understand whose work it is, how it relates to other pieces of, um, of work. So in, you know, in addition, if I could just sort of make the point that the, the varied values that students are bringing to the academy I think need to, you know, we need to better understand the anatomy of decision making and motivations by students. And there's a lot of academic literature in this area, but just a case study of one that um, an educator in New Zealand shared with me this week, that their son um, had responded to a Facebook advertisement to write a senior secondary school assessment for another student for a $50 fee. Um, the, the son of this educator jumped into the opportunity and was delighted to find that his piece of work was graded um, in excellence by the, um, by the school. The parents, both educators, 
were mystified why a child that otherwise presented as you know moral upstanding having great values would think this was okay and in the discussion the student really could not see what the problem was and you know for me this is a reminder that the variation of values that are being brought is part of a wider sort of sharing economy part of a productization of higher education in which products like assessments might increasingly be seen as a um, you know as a mechanism as an instrumental way of achieving an end um, as another product that can be just traded and shared um, and 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 takes you to a pathway so some of our values um, based on some renaissance idea of the value and importance of intellectual endeavor and so on may not be shared by increasing numbers of students and this is not about immoral students this is about varied values that learners um, bring so if we do not deeply work with students to share why cheating is bad for qualifications for industry for the community for the individual learner in a way that goes far beyond just rules and um, checklists and um, written attestations we won't address the underlying demand issue that's driving the industry. Mm, this is a really interesting topic. I think the other panellists would want to also comment, but where does the responsibility lie? Does it lie, your regulators are targeting the providers of those services. Do you take it down to the companies themselves, the platform itself for disseminating the information, the students, the parents, or is it the assessment and the teachers? And, or is it all of those? And where do you start? I mm. love your reflections, it's, Helen. It's absolutely all of those. In recent times when I've been presenting to academic boards or groups like that, I've shown them a, a Venn diagram which has TEXA, institutions and students because all of those people have responsibilities and some of those responsibilities are quite clearly delineated but where it gets really interesting is in the intersections between each of those circles. So institutions really genuinely partnering with students, making sure students do understand not just a module at the start that's compulsory and it's done but engaging students regularly throughout their education and actually trying to understand you know, when you're crafting policies or even modules does this make sense to you? Is this what you're seeing? Does this actually speak to your educational experience? So getting to what Grant's saying, what, what are they coming in with as their existing paradigm? And how can you shift them to what you want them to be your shared understanding of integrity and the importance of it? Mm. Great, anyone else on this topic? Um, I, I, I love that story, but I'd also remind, I mean, how many people have watched Suits? Anybody? <laughs> right? Yeah, five so, people. Well, so the guy, <laughs> five of us. Well, yeah, I'm, all a, there, I'm yeah. A, yeah, I'm a lawyer, right? So Suits is very popular amongst our students, and the hero of stu Suits is a young man who sits the law entrance exam for other people, and he's a hero for doing that because you know he's kind of an underdog making good and helping other underdogs making good. So I think you're quite right about that shifting value proposition. And I know we're probably, you know, possibly tired of hearing about it, but the universities, it, I think universities are in an awkward position now between sort of a very transactional monetary relationship with their students, in which case the hero exam taker maybe it might be quite appropriate because it's a it's a transaction it's 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 leading to a job this is the way to get it done and universities is having other kinds of values um, values that are relevant to education values relevant to sort of meaningful participation in 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 a ideal society but their intention and convincing students that one is is still relevant I think is a really 
is, is a really important but quite difficult task, particularly if students feel that the values of the university as you know, the ancient place of learning are not relevant to what they're gonna experience in the open world. I mean, rules on collusion, my students are constantly saying to me, we have a policy on collusion. You're not allowed to talk to other people about your assignments, but they will say, this is not relevant to the way I experience the world. I'm constantly on social media with my peers and colleagues and interacting and collaborating. So it's a difficult conversation, but you're right. We need to understand that from the perspective of the students, not just the values that we may mm. you know, think are self-evident. And I think they are important values, but I'm not sure they're self-evident. Mm. All right, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I suppose just to come back to, that, to, he to Helen's Venn diagram um, of responsibility, and it's something that, I, I, that we've been um, using in Ireland as well. We've, Ironically, probably in a in a panel on academic integrity, <laughs> we've we've just borrowed that that um, metaphor <laughs> from Helen. Um, but I, I think it's something that we we have al had already kind of been putting in, into practice. So we um, QQI has really been working in partnership with our institutions, and it is a genuine partnership. So we've established. Um, it, since 2019, we have the National Academic Integrity Network. Some of you will have heard me speaking about that yesterday. Um, and that is a peer-driven um, network of institutions that, I suppose, really works to embed cultures of academic integrity and values related to academic integrity within our higher education system. And again, coming back to that idea of, of what is students' responsibility? Students are members and equal members of that network as well. So they, they um, you know, from, from across the, the public and private um, sector, there are students there who are feeding in um, in their views. And all of, of that goes towards the creation of resources like our academic integrity lexicon. Um, that is, I suppose, a really important part of that is that it is accessible and understandable for students, so that they're clear on well, when I when we talk about collusion, what do we what do we mean? And mm. uh, when we talk about contract cheating, what do we mean? Um, and and we also through that network provide um, CPD for institutional staff, for students. We we go out and we speak to students and we listen to what what they're telling us. And um, so I suppose. That's probably a really roundabout way of saying, you know, everybody has a role to play. And I, I you know, we talked yesterday about the make it somebody's job, um, but 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 also everybody needs to be feeding into that culture of academic integrity within um, our system. Hmm. So uh, I have a great collusion story, by the way, when I once received an assignment, uh, five thousand words, from a girlfriend boyfriend. And they both wrote the exact same essay, but the al like alternative arguments. And I was like, that's actually a collusion. <laughs> so it was 5,000 words, but the exact opposite. Same references, same paragraph structure, everything. I'm like, well, that's awesome. <laughs> um, I still reported it, but you know. Um, I think last question before we go to the, the audience and our online audience. I hope online's still with us. I'm not checking social media. I've been trying to check the questions online. So um, we'll go to our audience in a moment. But the last question I have for the panel is, you know, as higher education providers, what do we do? It is such a difficult topic. It's so hard for us to keep up. What's your recommendation to providers about academic integrity? Do you want to start with someone else? I feel like I can. Yeah, keep maybe first. I'll go down the end there. Grant? Um, <laughs> yeah, very, la <laughs> very no large um, breath as I'd um, yeah, hesitate to. Um, I, I mean, just acknowledging the enormous amount of knowledge and practice that already exists um, in this room. I mean, from a regulator's standpoint, what I would observe is that um, for the 400 plus organisations that the New Zealand Qualifications Authority um, regulates, we can see very well developed policies, procedures and processes in place. So at a on paper, um, you know, at the level of what's on paper, actually a huge amount of confidence. Is there a gap between what institutions understand is good practice and what actually occurs on the ground. So if we know that direct and meaningful engagement with students right throughout a program is a core mitigation, 
um, to reduce cheating, is the business model of the institution geared in a way where that's actually possible? If we know that a diverse um, and more sophisticated range of assessments reduces cheating, is there systemic institutional support for academic staff to retool their approach to assessments? So I think the lie of the land is that institutions take this incredibly seriously, have a lot of policies, procedures and processes and a lot of commitment, but there are elements to the underlying business model, and we've touched on a number of those today, that in some ways enable cheating and make it harder to detect because of how the business model inside scaled institutions actually um, operates. So it's not advice, it's just a challenge to think about that um, dimension as well. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm an academic, so I'm going to say we need more research. Um, but I, I think that's absolutely right. But to go back to that point about how has social media changed cheating or, or, or academic integrity, which is probably the better word to use, is I think we need to understand that the model has changed and we need to take social media seriously as a source of challenge to academic integrity. Because as we know, social media is in our bedrooms with us at night and a student who, who aspires perhaps to the higher standards of academic integrity may nonetheless feel differently about that or more vulnerable about that at you know 2 p.m. in the morning in their room where they're struggling with a piece of assessment they can't complete and who's in touch with them, not the university, but, but social media and the chat group and the Whirlpool forum or, or the Snapchat um, discussion group. And that's, that's qualitatively and quantitatively different from what's gone before. So if we under, want to understand students um, in the what students' feelings about this, but also the triggers about relationships, then I would say we really need to look at social media because relationships on social media are probably closer to than the relationships with the university. And that's not about the university, that's about social media. Um, so we also need to understand that. Yeah, I suppose Grant mentioned policies and procedures and I, and I suppose um, we, would all, we would encourage institutions, because this is such a fast moving um, area and things are always developing and always changing, to be looking at their policies and procedures and really making sure that um, New, newer types of, of academic um, misconduct are, are referenced and defined so that students are really clear on what is misconduct and what, what is not. Um, and that, that, that is also referenced clearly and accessibly within student handbooks. Um, I suppose I've already mentioned um, as a second point the importance of, of really genuine student staff partnership and listening to students and being informed by institutions being informed and informing their approaches um, by what they're hearing from, from their students. Mm. Yeah, just it's one of those things that has so many different streams that institutions have to pick up. You know, can play the straight regulator back, bat, you know, it's a legal requirement that you ensure the students you're graduating have the knowledge, skills and experience. But we also recognise what an incredibly difficult task that, that has become in some instances. Um, in Australia, I think, you know, especially because we got burnt by my master nearly a decade ago now, that the policies, procedures, that kind of stuff is in place by and large, you know. So institutions are trying to build the positive integrity culture. They have those baseline architectural elements. That's great. Um, I think we have to think about, about um, as Kath Ellis, I'm not sure if she's still here, talks about the supply and demand side of things, you know. And so the work that Texa does tries to turn down um, the supply, you know, in, in removing those um, businesses or the access to those businesses. But there's also the demand side and, and institutions aren't really, I would say, certainly not consistently all of them, using all the detection tools that are readily available and, and doing the hard the hard conversations with the students, catching them in a time that is close to when they've committed the offence and having that, what should be you know, initially an educative conversation. Students are allowed to make mistakes, but unless we're catching them and educating them, they won't even necessarily recognise that it was a mistake and those will become entrenched behaviours. So it's not just one thing. I think institutions 
you know, I, I think everyone recognises there's no silver bullet and you have to have a comprehensive strategy that you're trying to drive forward in a number of different ways. Mm, interesting. Claire, I, I'm, I'm interested in the comments about detection because I know there was a session earlier on AI and, and the use of advanced technologies in um, contract cheating effectively or, or in essay writing. I mean, I wonder if detection is, is going to be increasingly not the goal that we can be striving that's realistic to striving for. I mean, it seems like a technological arms race. I'm interested on, on that. Uh, I think with a great deal of terror, I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I, I think um, I think detection of when students haven't done the learning is always going to be really, really important. I think what tools we have available to us to try and meet that goal will be different. There's a really great conversation about you know, AI and is the use of AI even cheating? I think that's sort of a, a separate and really interesting conversation. But identifying where a student has not actually developed the knowledge, skills and experience to receive an award is always going to be a really, really important thing that institutions need to do because otherwise we're not graduating safe practitioners and we're losing the public's trust in our graduates. Hmm. Right, I'm going to go to the audience for questions and there's lots of them, so... <laughs> Oh my goodness, there's even more. Most enthusiastic waiver is there. This is near the <laughs> enthusiastic waiver, near the suit section. Yeah. Uh, my name's Carlos from the University, uh, University of Melbourne Student Union. Um, now, thank you for that very, very cool discussion. Um, but I'm just thinking whether this, the discussion is starting to seem a bit like the war on drugs, where we criminalise the act instead of addressing the underlying causes. One underlying cause is quality of delivery. In the case of some students, some of their subject coordinators do not provide answers to practical exams, for instance, or provide exemplars for, essay, for students to follow. This gap in the quality of delivery is what make, it, 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 it's, it's what's making students use these cheating platforms. <clears throat> also, previous panelists today have mentioned the way that examinations are coordinated that perhaps can do students towards these cheating platforms to begin with. In the context of these um, underlying causes, is there a scope for discussions about enhancing the quality of course delivery and innovating new methods of examination instead of just focusing on the criminalization of these platforms? So I think we've discussed a lot around assessment and changes. I just want if anyone wants to pick up further on that topic. Um, I suppose I can talk to assessment a little bit. Um, so in Ireland, we are currently looking, we're rethinking assessment. We're conducting a project um, in QQI called Rethinking Assessment, and we're doing that by talking to students. So we've been conducting a number of learner focus groups, listening to what they find good and what, what's, you know, maybe where the challenges are when it comes to assessment. Um, and I suppose it's, it's been... Um, some of what we're hearing in those focus groups is reinforcing what we're hearing from students that we speak to in relation to academic integrity. So um, things like, um, I, suppose I, I actually, I'd made some notes from, from the, the, those learner focus groups um, who spoke about, you know, the, the importance of, of a connection with their, with their tutor, with their lecturers, and how that can really be a positive um, influence on, uh, you know, and, and an encouragement to behave with integrity. Um, and I suppose that similarly, you know, how class sizes and, you know, smaller, smaller sizes can really, you know, help to de develop that. It's possibly something that during COVID um, maybe suffered, that, that connection between the learner and, and, and um, the, the instructors. Um, because, I mean, we actually just spoke before we came on stage about, the difficulty of establishing a connection through a screen and um, the difficulty for the instructor, for the lecturer, looking at a, a sea of, of initials on a screen. Um, so I, I, I do think that the face-to-face -face is, is helpful in a move, you know, t a move towards a hybrid or a face-to-face -face, um, delivery will, will be helpful in that regard. Excellent. I might go back to questions and at the front. Uh, if we could get the mic. While the mic's coming, I'm just going to read out a comment online, which is um, 
It's not a question but a comment, fav favourite of conferences. Uh, I, feel <laughs> I feel we are partly to blame for the current prevalence of academic integrity breaches. Younger generations are being brought up to be more comfortable with questioning authority, this is very true, uh, doing things differently and thinking outside the square and live by the mantra, work smarter, not harder. With that in mind, it isn't a far stretch for young younger people to look for more efficient ways to achieve the end goal. I think it's a really interesting observation. And over to Sharon. Thanks. Um, a number of times we've talked about make it somebody's job and the idea that it's also everybody's responsibility. Um, I'm interested in uh, the engagements with, and we, we talk about institutions, I'm interested in the engagements with the sector as a whole, and I'm thinking particularly um, university chancellors, university vice chancellors, who are by and large collectively uh, shape up the culture, shape up the decision making, the priorities, the resourcing, etc. Um, engage with the models, and, and they seem to be outside of this discussion. Whenever, whenever I hear it, I don't hear a lot about how um, there's engagements with them collectively about how they're thinking about responding to engaging with what is a sector wide, clearly and you know, global kind of problem. We seem to go from the regulator to individual institutions, down to researchers, teachers as practitioners in the field, and it, it, I just don't hear them brought into that conversation, and particularly around some of the kinds of, you know, issues that have been brought up, and what has been described as irritants, frustrations, and a lack of enabling conditions within universities to really engage it. So I'd be interested to know whether I've missed something in that space. No, I, I think it's absolutely a great question. Um, and the Venn diagram that I normally talk about, I expand when I'm talking to, for example, the chairs of academic boards of the universities to say, you can do the same thing in an institution. What's the responsibility of management? What's the responsibility of academic board? What's the responsibility of deans, right? You need to unpack all of those things and understand what's in each group's area to control. What are the things that they can actually be doing to enable this? Because it is holistic. It absolutely needs resourcing and it needs buy-in by all of those areas. So, I mean, I, I certainly do get invited to speak to Universities of Australia, DVCA groups and chairs of academic boards and I spoke recently to the Guild HE, the vice chancellors in the UK. So, we are having those conversations with a lot of different levels. And can I just say, in, in Ireland equally, um, it is something that we are inviting our senior leaders, um, our higher education leaders, into the room to speak to them about. And actually, Helen and Kath and Kane have all spoken to the senior leaders of our, our public higher education institutions, our universities, our technological universities. And through that and through the work of our, our National Academic Integrity Network, we're really starting to see momentum building and real buy-in from senior leaders, and that's really essential because they're the people who are resourcing this and who need to who really need to support their staff and their students um, to implement um, the, the, the practice. If I can add to that, I, I guess what I would also like to see, I mean, I guess over COVID, all of us understanding of um, teaching change. So what I saw from my perspective was actually junior lecturers, levels A's and B's working really, really, really hard um, only to be criticised for low levels of student engagement or whatever. So I think it would also, what I would love to see is for some of the chancellors and vice chancellors, and I'm sure some of them do this, actually go and sit in the room with some level A's and B's and just follow their week, see what they do all week for their job. Um, and then think about the types of support that those teachers might need to respond to academic integrity and student feedback and a meaningful relationship with small groups of students and not engage, you know, not have a transactional, you know, like I'd like to see you guys tenses just track those hours. That's great. I think we might wrap up our panel now if everyone's oh. had a say. Uh, I think we're, ah, we're out of time. Well, the chat's there, though. Put put your comments in the chat, and um, and, and you can find us at drinks. <laughs> oh, she's a, she's desperate to ask a question. Okay, there's one more, and uh, nice and short. Thank you. 
me to pass them. And so I needed to sit down and ask them to speak to me about what they understood about their placement. And from that, I could say, yes, I can pass you, but you're now going to have to go and get some cultural immersion because you're going to be a practitioner of social work and you need to lift your English. So, you know, what is the investment that the industry is doing and which cohorts of students are much more vulnerable to purchasing something because they cannot afford to fail? I think the industry needs to examine itself. Mm. If you are building your industry on the backbone of the hopes and dreams and aspirations of the burgeoning middle classes in the developing world where I come from, where the English is not quite up to scratch, what are you doing about it? Excellent. I'm going to actually take that as a comment and uh, not a question but I think it's a really important point and it comes down to the heart of the panel today which is we've been really saying where is the responsibility where do we actually target and I think the Venn diagram is a really good point that it's actually everyone's responsibility as well um, so I'm going to wrap up the panel and we're going to move to our final session and I'd like us to thank our panel thank you very much thank, thank you